the title of my research project and of this presentation today is The Effect of Burn Timing on Insect Assemblages in a Recent Prairie Reconstruction. And you can see there just a few of the people that I'll get to thanking towards the end, but just a little preview for you. So a little bit of background information about why I chose this project and why I think it's so important. First off, insects and prairies are just huge. They've got a wide array of ecological roads, everything from predation to being a food source for a variety of different organisms. They're pollinators. They help with soil decomposition and soil aeration. Without them, really, the tall grass prairie and most other ecosystems in the world just could not exist, or at the very least, could not function the way we know them today. They're also a huge component of the biomass of the tall grass prairie. Um, I read in Samson and Na, it's a book called Prairie Conservation that really insects are more, uh, excuse me, represent more of the biomass in the tall grass prairie than do any of the charismatic megafauna or the vegetation of the tall grass prairie. So if you kind of let that sink in, that really tells you how many of them are there and how many of them we're not even seeing. On top of that, when we touch on the restoration and, or the reconstruction part of this project, we have a huge potential for habitat expansion here in the state of Iowa. It used to be that about 85% of the state was tall grass prairie. Native, you know, they could just go from one area to the other, just very free flow. Well, anymore, we've got less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of this native habitat left. So when we're talking about reconstructions, you know, we do our best, but we're never going to get quite to the same level that a native prairie would be. But what we can do for them is we can provide ways for them to get from an area of native vegetation to another area of native vegetation by way of these little tiny islands of reconstructed prairie. It's not ideal, but it's something. And then finally, the final component, I guess, of my project is looking at management techniques. I've decided to focus specifically on fire, but there's a number of different techniques. And really, this is sometimes a bone of contention between animal ecologists and plant ecologists. Plant ecologists look at things, you know, they look at things and they say, well, if we burn or if we mow or if we hay, we're going to improve the habitat overall. But then the animal ecologists look at it from the point of view that, well, if we do all that, then the animals can't live there for the time while this ecosystem is recuperating. And so there's, there's sometimes a little bit of contention between these two schools of thought. So here are some of the concerns specifically of entomologists. The first one I'm going to talk about is actually fire timing. You're talking about life history here. So basically, any group of organisms is always going to have a time frame that's very sensitive for them. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, if you burn and they, um, even if you burn in the dormant season, if they lay their eggs on some of the dead stems from the year's previous veg or the previous year's vegetation, if you burn those and the eggs are on them, the eggs are gone. Whereas if you went with an active season burn, then you're, you know, you may interrupt their life cycle. Even if they can escape the fire, you may interrupt their reproduction or something like that. So that's something to definitely take into consideration. <coughs> Another concern of entomologists is actually the frequency of fire. Now, Panzer in his 2000 paper actually talks about the fire attrition hypothesis. And basically what this really focuses on is that you may not lose all of your diversity in one single fire event. What might happen actually is that which, with each successive fire event, your diversity gets just a little bit lower and a little bit lower until you've really lost a good chunk of it. And so that's something he kind of explored in his paper. And um, I won't go into his results, but it's just kind of something to think about when you talk about management. Another thing is just looking at the amount of area that you burn. A lot of animal ecologists really promote the use of refugia, so leaving an area unburned for the animals to be able to recolonize from. Intensity of fire is very, very important because anyone who's worked on a fire line can tell you a head fire and a back fire and a flank <coughs> fire are not the same thing. The, you know, if you've never been on one, you think fire is fire is fire, but that's really not the case. And that leads into also the type of fire. So a head fire, while it's going to burn very hot and very quickly, it's also going to pass over the area quite rapidly. So if you've got soil organisms there, they're probably not going to be harmed because it, the fire moves so fast, most of the time, the soil won't even have a chance to heat up, so they're going to be spared. However, if you were to run a backfire or something like that, it creeps more slowly over the vegetation, thus heating the soil a little bit more, 
and you start possibly seeing effects from that. So these are just some of the things that entomologists have raised concerns about in the past. I want to go quickly into a couple of studies that really kind of guided what I did. The first one is by Anderson and Mueller, and forgive me, I forgot to put the date there, but that paper is from 2000. And they studied an Australian tropical savanna. So they're working in a very, very different ecosystem than I am here. But they compared early and late season <coughs> annual burns. They did uh, an annual burn five years in a row and then just kind of studied the effects. So this was a fairly long-term study, very well done. And here's what they found. They saw minimal long-term effects or impacts on the taxa, and they also saw rapid recolonization post-fire. Within about two months of when they had burned, they saw all the same taxa that they'd seen prior to them burning. One thing I do want to point out, and this is why I kind of chose a different path for my study, is they'd studied this at the ordinal level. So they're looking at orders of insects. They're not breaking it down to families or genera or anything else like that. So there's a chance that they really could be missing some finer details. It's, it's not to say that their study is bad, it's just looking at a different scale. The second study that I'd like to kind of briefly touch on is by Johnson et al. And this is actually a paper from 2008 was when it was published. And they compared seasonal burns in the Texas Hill Country. So we're at least kind of getting closer to the same area of the world that I'm working in. And they compared a dormant and a growing season burn. So they did fall, or excuse me, summer and a winter burn. Now that's not the kind of thing we can necessarily do in Iowa. Winter we've got snow on the ground, doesn't really help us with fire there. And then in the summer it's just generally too green or there are other conditions that make it imp or unlikely to carry a successful burn. Well, what they found was they didn't see any significant difference between the treatments, but I will point out a few flaws in their study. The first thing is they identified to the family level, which again, looking at a, at a different scale than I am, so there's pros and cons to both of those. But they had a very, very small sample size. They only sampled one day, and they had um, a sample size of 245 insects, which just, it's really not that many. They also only sampled four excuse me, four winter burn plots and four summer burn plots. So it just, I don't feel it was really extensive enough to be able to draw any conclusions from. So a little bit about the site that I'm working at. Um, the area in red here is actually my specific location within the overall site. But we're looking down here, it's the Cedar River Natural Resource Area, and it's down in between Washburn and LaPorte City, just off of <coughs> Old Highway 218 or I guess it's new Highway 218, but I think of 380 as 218, so my apologies there. <laughs> and you can see I've got just a small portion of the overall site, but it's part of a, a larger research area, and so a lot of the other <coughs> fields were dedicated to a different research project. A little bit of background for the site. This was formerly an agricultural field for a few decades at least. It was in a corn and soybean rotation, and we uh, leased it I believe, in 2008. So we had the farmer who had been planting their plant soybeans in the summer of 2008 as kind of a placeholder for us, so it just didn't lay fallow for a year and get a lot of weed seeds in there. And we also had him apply glyphosate twice during that summer. It was drill seeded to native vegetation, um, a 16 species mix heavy on the Forbes in November of 2008. And in July of 2009, so just before I started here, we did apply some establishment mowing. Well, I got in in August, and so uh, I had never worked with insects before, and I decided it'd be a really, really good idea for me to do some preliminary sampling so that I could kind of get used to some different sampling techniques and also so that I could identify some abundant groups here. And what really came out of that was I found out that there were a whole lot of grasshoppers and there were a whole lot of beetles. And so um, Orthoptera and Coleoptera, those two orders, were by far the, the biggest that I was catching. And so I decided to go ahead and choose two groups out of that. And you can see I chose Carabidae, those are the ground beetles. And I kind of like the juxtaposition between these two groups. Carabidae, these are ground beetles, and as their name suggests, they are ground dwelling. They're also predaceous for the most part, which means they're going to be hunters, or at least ambush hunters. The other family that I chose was Acrididae, the short-horned grasshoppers. They're herbivorous, and they're more likely to utilize the canopy. 
So just kind of, I liked that I got two very different ecological roles. It, I feel it gives me a good comparison. So onto my plot layout. I used a randomized block design. Each of my plots is about 15 meters by 30 meters, and we measured it out very carefully, so they're within maybe a half meter on either side. They're separated into two blocks, and a lot of that has to do with, you can see there's a line of trees here and a line of trees here, whereas on the other side, you've got the rest of the field. So we split it up by blocks because one of them quite obviously has a lot more area surrounded by other grasses, and one of them has a lot more of its edge surrounded by trees. So just to kind of account for any edge effects, we decided to break it into two blocks. And then we have three replicates per block. And so I know it's quite small, but kind of the light buff color that you're looking at, those are my control plots. Those were not burned at all during this time period. The darker brown are the fall plots, so they were burned in November, and then the green were spring burned plots, so they were burned in April. And this orange area here is actually just a buffer between the two blocks. I decided I didn't want them directly abutting each other because then it just seemed like it would be good to have them a little bit separated. And then all of these have a five meter mow lane in between them. We also mowed on the outside where all of this grass is. You can kind of see that it's a little bit lighter around there. So those are mow lanes just to keep it separated from all the other vegetation surrounding it. And like I mentioned before, we had, I'm comparing seasonal burns. So we burned both years of my study. So November 2009 and November 2010, burn was applied to the fall burn plots. And in April of 2010 and April of 2011, we applied fire to the spring burn sites. Now I'm gonna outline my hypotheses for you. I've got about five of them. So my first hypothesis was that insect species richness will increase over time on all plots. Whether it was burned or not burned, I imagined since this is such a new planting, only planted in 2008, the only place we've got to go is up. The other, or my second hypothesis was that insect species richness will increase more on the burned plots. So there will be, you know, the insects will be more attracted to those. And that plots burned in the spring will have the highest richness at the end of two years. Third hypothesis, the abundance of ground beetles will increase on burned plots post-fire. And that was really based on, they are predaceous. So I, my line of reasoning was that if there's less to get in, in the way of them and their prey, it's probably going to be better for them. Now grasshoppers, I actually made the opposite hypothesis. I thought that the abundance would decrease on burned plots post-fire, and this was because if there's not as much um, both vegetative matter near the ground or the canopies, the standing dead material, it might provide a little less cover for them and they may be more prone to being predated. So. Insect sampling. I started this in June of 2010. In 2010, I managed to get two sampling periods in. So I sampled in June and then again in September. In 2011, we sampled in June, July, and again in August. And in each plot, I'll go back a couple of slides here. You can see these dots correlate to approximately where I put a trap. Every trap was located um, more than five meters in from the edge of the plot, and they were all separated by about five meters. So they were laid out in a grid formation. Oop. Let me get back to my screen here. And then they were covered in between sampling periods just so that you didn't have extra mortality because a hole in the ground is still a hole in the ground. If it has the cup in it, it's more likely to catch insects, but even if it's just bare dirt, if they can't get out of it, that leads to extra mortality in between my sampling periods, and I did want to avoid that. And then I did attempt to sweep net once, but I had very, very poor results. And there is actually a paper out on this. They did a literature review, kind of looking at the effectiveness of different types of um, sampling methods for grasshoppers specifically. And they said, they, they agreed with me that when you're in tall grass, it's just, it's very hard to get those grasshoppers with a sweep net. So I did that once in July 2010 and said, that's enough for me. So we also did vegetative sampling for this study because we did want to look at how the fire was going to be affecting the vegetation because that is what they live in. So we sampled in late June slash early July of 2010 and then again in mid-September. And then in 
um, excuse me, in 2011, we did only sample once because we found there wasn't really a significant difference between the two sampling periods in 2010. And for all three of these, we had a few different measures that we were looking at. We did 10 random samples in each plot, and those were just done on, we had a, excuse me, a random number generator. And so we would start at the very first trap in the southwest corner of the plot, and we would pace off from there. So we take so many steps forward, so many steps in, and that's just how we did it for every single one. And in these samples, we did a species identification for everything that was in the plot, including weeds. Um, for native vegetation, we did basal coverage by species, and this was at about one inch off the ground. And then we separated aerial coverage into whether it was a grass or whether it was a forb. So that was just a very rough estimate. Um, we also did duff sampling, where we clipped within the quadrat and we took all of the dead vegetative material at or near the ground surface and just collected it. It was put in a drying oven for two to three days, and then it was weighed to see basically how much we were getting off each plot. We didn't do this again because we realized it just it correlated quite directly with the percent cover of duff, which we measured out in the field. So it was just kind of an extra thing that we did then. And I touched on this, but we also did percent cover of bare ground at the soil surface and percent cover of duff within probably three inches of the soil surface. So a little bit about my statistics. Um, what I've been able to run so far is I've done analysis of variance on all of the different um, <coughs> things that were measured, both insects and vegetation. And I'm currently working on getting some regressions put together because there's a few relationships that seem to be playing out and I'm just using regression as a way to kind of solidify the correlation. And then we're also going to try some permanova, which is permutational analysis of variance. And I have a bit more reading to do on this, but I'm going to be working with Mark Myers. And this is going to be a very good way to compare the entire community composition between the, the different treatments. And finally, I did have a lab portion of this project. I did a lot of identification. So grasshopper adults were identified. I didn't do the nymphs because they're primarily identified by um, genital morphology. And it's kind of hard to figure out if it's even a guy or a girl when they're small enough. So I identified my September 2010 sample and found overall there was very low diversity and I'll also go into in a little bit why I haven't really done a whole lot with August yet, uh, excuse me, August 2011. And then the ground beetles in all sampling periods were identified to genus. And again, these were just adults. And these have kind of become the main focus of my study as I've worked more through this. So here's just a quick list. I'm not going to read them all off. But this gives you a picture of the diversity I was getting. Now, I mentioned that grasshoppers were low diversity. Uh, excuse me. And you might be saying, well, eight's not a bad number. Well, probably 95% of my sample was one of three species in August of 2010. Um, I probably saw about 45% was Melanophilus femorubrum. 45% was sang uh, Melanoplus sanguinipi sanguinipis, and then about 5% was Melanoplus differentialis. The rest of them were just scattered individuals throughout my entire sample and just not particularly diverse in that situation. The ground beetles, on the other hand, they showed a much higher diversity. I had 16 different genera, several of which <coughs> did seem to indicate that there were several species present, but ground beetle uh, identification is a rather difficult task, and so I decided that identifying to the genus level was going to be sufficient. So the other reason that I haven't necessarily delved into all of the grasshoppers is, you can see here, I caught a whole lot of grasshoppers. <laughs> um, in 2011, I'm not sure if it was just a really good year for them, I'm not sure if maybe we had a, some minor flooding events in 2010, so I don't know if maybe that's part of the reason the numbers were lower, or if it's just age of the planting. But we had a very big year. And so I decided that, you know, even I might try a subsample at some point, possibly. But with the low diversity from 2010, 2011, as I was going through the samples, didn't indicate that there was any more diversity this year. So I decided to kind of focus on the ground beetles. 
Now I'm going to get into a lot of graphs here, so if you feel the need to stop me at any point, feel free. I'll answer questions as I go along. That's fine with me. But here are my 2010 grasshopper results. We do see a significant relationship in June 2010. We see that on control plots, it's a bit lower, but by September, this is gone. There is absolutely no significant value between the treatments. Is this just total mm -hmm. abundance? This is total, total abundance. Total. Yeah, okay. this is total abundance. It's um, average catch per unit effort. So I took the count in each plot and divided it by the number of traps because occasionally we did have trap predation. Um, some traps had been removed or damaged during the course of the sampling period, so we don't want to, of course, count those. And so I just put it in terms of catch per unit effort and averaged for each of the treatments. And then for ground beetles in 2010, again, you don't see any significant relationship. But one thing kind of stood out to me as I was working through my identification. I noticed that I wasn't seeing tiger beetles on my control plots. And so I went ahead and ran the stats on this. And I ran it on all the other groups as well, but this was the only one that stood out in 2010. You can see on the burned plots, the tiger beetles are very significantly higher. I mean, a p-value of 0 0.019 is very, very significant. So now I'll jump into 2011. Again, um, grasshoppers, they had a really strange set of results. You can see in 2011, there was no significant relationship with treatment in June. But in July, you see they're actually higher on control plots, which is the opposite of the result we found in June 2010. <coughs> I don't necessarily have an explanation for this. I've talked with John Ophis, and we can't come up with anything. And then, again, by late season, any significant results we'd seen earlier just absolutely disappear. In 2011, we see the ground beetles actually start displaying a slightly different trend. In June and July, not a significant relationship. But here in August, you actually see that far and away the control plots are showing a greater abundance of ground beetles than either of the other two treatments. Now, again, I broke this out by, gener or by genus to kind of look at what might be going on here. So here's the tiger beetle results. Cisindel is the gen genus name there. So you see much, much lower consistently in all three sampling periods on the control plots. So that's as we expect. Well, I started looking into the other genera here, as I did in 2011 or in 2010, and there were some relationships that hadn't been there the previous year. Now these are all genera that were represented in my sample from 2010, but they did not show a significant result. Cyclotrichalis um, was significantly higher in both June and July of 2011. I'm still working through parts of my, two th or of my August 2011 sample, so I can't give you the results there, but I imagine we're still gonna see that trend continuing. Now when we go to this genus, Posilis, we see in all three sampling periods, we have a much, much greater number on the control plots than we do on either of the other burn or on either of the burn treatments. Another interesting thing to note, and I'm going to go back and compare this to my total beetle or abundance slide, but look at how much that goes up. I think this genus Posilis and also Cyclotrichalis are major driving factors in, excuse me, this result right here. Now, again, I'm waiting to see Cyclotrichalis kind of bear me out on this, but I have a feeling that it's going to be a highly significant relationship in August as well. Now, I want to compare the last slide where you see a strong relationship in all three sampling periods to the 2010 results. Now, when I went back and I looked at this, you see in June that there, there seems like there should be a significant relationship. And I do need to check out why my error bar is so crazy in this particular one. But I've, I've checked my math, and so far it looks good. So it may be that this genus just throughout the season is going to be significantly higher on, um, excuse me, on control plots, but that for some reason just statistical error. We're, we're having a, an error bar that just wipes that out. Now, I did think it was interesting to note 
that in September, very, very late in the season for uh, pitfall trapping, we don't see that relationship anymore. It is lower on the burned plots, but it's not statistically significant there. I do have a thought as to why this is. Um, with my vegetative sampling, there was really only one factor that stood out consistently between all five sample or all three sampling periods, and that was the amount of duff. These are all taken probably a foot and a half above the ground, just straight down with my camera, and these are all very characteristic of what we are seeing consistently in these different treatments. So you can see the control is very thick, it's very lush, there's a lot of dead material near the ground. Fall, it's an intermediate, and control, really, you'll see a few small, um, I think some of these are actually remnants of the flood. I think they washed in with the minor flooding events in 2010, which is when these pictures were taken. But really, you were seeing a few small pieces, but really no dead vegetative matter from the native vegetation. And when I went ahead and ran the statistics on, or ran the statistics and also graphed this, you see a really strong relationship. And I find it very interesting that in 2010, you know, there's still a significant relationship. But if you compare the control plot to both the fall and the spring in 2011, that difference is absolutely crazy. I think that this is the driving factor in those two genera behaving differently in 2011 than they did in 2010. And it also shows you how very quickly the duff does accumulate when you don't burn, because you're looking at less than 20% coverage of dead vegetative material, or excuse me, less than 20% bare ground, more than 80% duff coverage in these control plots in the second year. When you compare that here, they're closer to 50 and 60% bare ground. Oh, excuse me. I mean to touch on, Nimela uh, did a literature review in 1993. He was actually looking at interspecific competition between ground beetle assemblages. And one of the conclusions that he came out of the paper with was that actually this right here, the, compare, or the structural interference within um, some of these areas was very clearly a driving factor for a lot of these things. So it's not that they're really competing with each other, it's that they need different resources. And I'll touch on that in some more of my conclusions. So to start in on my conclusions here, my results were not consistent at the family level. You didn't see consistent significance between sampling periods when you were looking at that higher taxonomic level. So that does kind of indicate that some of these studies that are looking at the family or the ordinal level, they might be looking at too, um, they're not looking at fine enough a scale. The other thing that I, this is somewhat anecdotal, but I really do feel that grasshoppers are likely just too mobile to really be affected, especially late in the season, by the setup that I had. I mean, my, my trans, or excuse me, my plots were 15 by 30 meters, which is a fairly good area, but my mow lanes were only five meters, and I very frequently would see them jump from one plot to the other. I don't think it caused any sort of hindrance to them just moving very freely. I, you know, there were times I'm pretty sure they were going between fields, and there were tree lines between fields. So, yeah just not hindered in their mobility. I don't think it was necessarily the best group to study, but hindsight makes fools of us all. And then another conclusion that I drew from this is that the different genera of beetles are reacting differently to the fire treatments. So what we see is Cisandella, Cyclotralis, and Posilis all show a relationship to the fire treatment. <coughs> or excuse me, not so much to the fire treatment, but rather if it was burned or if it was not burned. And then Cisandella, the tiger beetles, are higher on burned plots, whereas Cyclotrochalis and Posilis, again, we're seeing the opposite. They're higher on control, excuse me, Cisandella higher on the burned plots, and the other two were higher on control plots, but the relationship was only significant in the second year of the study. So I just thought that was very interesting to note, and again, it kind of bears out that looking at the family scale is, it's just not fine enough. So touching a little bit on some of the genera of beetles that I found results for, Cisandella, it's interesting to note, they can actually run faster than their, their 
eyes can take in for in information and then their brains can process this information. They are running hunters. They hunt similarly to cheetahs, but they have one serious disadvantage. They go after their prey, but every so often they have to stop and take in their surroundings again and then take off in another direction if their prey has changed direction. So having less structural interference, you know, less duff at the ground surface, is probably a huge benefit to their hunting strategy. And it's it, in the literature that they are known to prefer less vegetated areas. They are known to be in pathways, um, things like uh, oftentimes even blow, sand blowouts. They like to habitate those areas. So, And then the other two, they were higher on control plots in 2011. So there's a couple of different thoughts that you could take away here. They might be sensitive to repeated burns. The other thought that comes to mind is that maybe increasing the, the structural, um, excuse me, the structural, I can't think of my word, I'm sorry. Increasing the amount of duff near the soil surface might actually be a higher benefit to them. You know, 60% just might not be enough to really draw them into the areas, but when it's closer to, you know, 80% coverage, that might be enough that it really does provide a benefit to them. So a little bit about where I'm going to go for, from here. I do have some more statistical analysis to do, so I'm hoping to graduate in 2000, or excuse me, in two, December 2012. So I just have my permutational analysis to finish up, and now that I've gotten these done, my data is all in order, so that should go very quickly. And then I do want to run some regressions. Um, I ran a few, and you do see a very strong correlation between the amount of um, bare ground and then how these different genera of beetles are behaving. So then, next step is to write and defend my thesis. Again, hoping to be done by December 2012. And then, I will graduate, and I will get a job, and my life will be very exciting then. <laughs> well, <laughs> it is now, but at the same time, I'll feel like more of a grown up. <laughs> so, a, a quick thank you to those that have funded me. Um, I'm part of the Prairie Power Project through um, the Tallgrass Prairie Center here. So the Office of Energy Independence of the State of Iowa has provided a lot of my funding. I've also gotten a lot of support from the Tallgrass Prairie Center here, and of course, the National Resource Conservation Service. And a quick set of acknowledgments. Of course, all of my different funding sources. The University of Northern Iowa, uh, specifically the Bi Department of Biology. You guys have been an immense help. Um, Dr. Daryl Smith, my advisor, and Dave Williams, they've been with me every step of this, making sure that I had a very sound research base and that my hypotheses were good, even though they were wrong, they were good. <laughs> and then the staff and students of the Tallgrass Prairie Center, um, specifically Molly Slumbum. She is now living in San Antonio, but she has been my companion through this process and helped me a lot with my project. I'd also like to thank the other members of my committee, Dr. Mark Myers and Dr. John Ofis, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but they've been immense help as well. And then finally, a quick thanks to David O'Shields, Dave Williams, Jim Mason, and Dr. Daryl Smith for providing photos to me for this presentation. And now I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. So the ground beetles that really like the, the, the control plots, mm -hmm. did you look into maybe why, like, could it be related to the fact that their eggs didn't get burned last year? Or? Well, I don't think it's probably that, because we did apply a burn both years, so that didn't change. Um, the amount of time since burn was not a factor in my study. There might be something in their life history. I haven't looked into them as much as I have some of the others. Tiger beetles are a very easy to identify group, so they were one of the first ones that I had finished, and so I was able to look into their life history a bit more than I was some of the other genera of beetles. But it could also be, tiger beetles are, are very pretty, and I know that that shouldn't necessarily be a basis in why you study something, but there's a lot of literature on them because they draw people's interests. Some of these other genera of beetles, I just don't feel like there's as much literature out there, but I am going to start a search on that as I'm writing my thesis. Great, but their population is higher in the control plots, right? They're right. They're not burned. Right. And they were not burned for two years in a row, and I'm just curious if you had any thoughts as to well, but it wasn't, could that play a role? It wasn't burned before that either. 
Right, right. And their oh. numbers were really high there, mm -hmm. as opposed to the, the burned area. I understand that. I get. I understand what you're saying. That could be a factor, and maybe that's something that I need to look into. Is again, go into their life history and see where they lay their eggs, because if they are laying it on the soil surface, that is a good thought. So. Thank you for clarifying, because I didn't understand you at first. Yes? Do we know what the fauna of ground beetles, beetles is like um, in uh, the previous vegetation, which was row crops? No, I didn't look into that at all. Um, I know that Jim, with his project, did some sampling out in the row crop fields. Um, I didn't approach the farmer about doing that because while Jim was just doing walking transects, mine's a little bit more invasive, yeah, and so. More in the literature. Oh, I'll have to look into that. Sampling. Yep, I haven't looked into that. I will say that. I, no, I haven't. My preliminary sampling, the vegetation had already been planted, so that might be something that I should look into. I know that there are. I know Kirk Larson didn't do it, but there's actually a very, very old paper that if I can get my hands on it might kind of indicate some of that. It, it was done, I think, in the 1920s or 1930s, and I just haven't been able to find that paper. There, there's some, uh, Iowa State's done some research on weed seed predation, mm -hmm. crop fields, and a lot of it's crowded fields. Okay. So at least for that group of uh, you know, <coughs> seed eaters, seed predators, yeah. there would be that. They would have something in that group of species. Okay. Professor from the Cora that presented here. He yeah. Said in his presentation that he did look at. And I'll have to go. Were in row crops. And I'll have to go back to his papers because I do have about two or three of them. So, but I was focusing again a little bit more on directly related to my thesis because when you start your literature review, that's where your mind is. So. Yes. You're going to do it again. Do you do anything different? I think I'd entirely skip the grasshoppers. <laughs> um, they're interesting, but at the same time, that result where they were significant in opposite ways in two very different um, sampling periods where they'd be at different stages of their life history. I sat down with uh, Dr. Ofis and, and I said, why might this be? And he said, I have no idea. And then I, I knew that I was going to have a really fun time writing about that. So. Well, what were they doing falling in cups on the ground? Grasshoppers. Uh, this I've actually picked up a little bit from just watching them. Because they'll leap from vegetation, but more often than not, they don't actually make it to another piece of vegetation. They fall to the ground. So then they'll crawl, or you know, they'll walk to another stem and climb back up. So it, just as you watch them in the field, I don't have any data for this, of course. This is just very anecdotal. But it's kind of funny to watch them because they jump from a piece of vegetation and then just most of the time fall to the ground. So, and I do have. I, I haven't looked into this and I don't intend to, but my sample's still in the freezer, so if a future student came in and wanted to look into it, they'd be there, possibly. But I think that some of them might actually be infected with horsehair worms. Again, I'm not sure about that, but horsehair worms are a parasite that infects grasshoppers specifically, and when they mature and get ready, or when the worms mature and get ready to reproduce, they actually hardwire the grasshopper to want to jump into bodies of water. And so, I mean, my cups were just, they were nine ounce red solo cups that I put in the ground. So it wasn't like it was a large thing, but there were a few times I was going through the grasshoppers and I pulled out this long string-like something from them. And so I do wonder if there could potentially be an infection in this population. I don't know for sure, because again, way out of the scope of my study, but it'd be something interesting to look into. It would skew the results. Yes, it would. <laughs> and that would explain why I caught 27,000 grasshoppers in two years. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So that could be why I'm not seeing results. But again, without starting another master's project, I probably can't answer that question. So, yeah. There's a possibility. It could be that some of them went up to the cup sensing that there was moisture there and were thinking maybe they would, you know, a grab a drink or something. But I, again, like you just said, it seems like that'd be a lot of grasshoppers making the same mistake. Is there any evidence, so. like you said, a different life stage, different levels of 
Is it related to whether they have wings or not, how mobile, how mobile they are? No, because since they, since they, from the nymphal stages, they've got very powerful legs. I mean, I don't think they're probably crossing the lines quite as much in early June as they do in September, because September I've seen them jump more than the length of a truck ahead of me. Um, but at the same time, I don't know if that'd be what what the basis is, because then I would expect them to be significant in both of my June sampling periods. I did have that thought when I was just looking at my 2010 data that maybe um, since there would be more structural interference blocking sunlight getting to the ground surface, that on burned plots the grasshoppers might actually be hatching earlier. So that's why we might see a flush in June and it might be gone by September. But then I would expect to see that or even a stronger result in June of 2011. So, yes? You have good evidence on three of the genera mm -hmm. of the ground beetles. Do you have any thoughts about the other, what, 17 or uh, 20? Let's see, it'd be 13. 13. Most of them really didn't show any results. Um, they weren't significant. They just, they did whatever the ground beetles wanted to do and they did it happily. Because um, I mean, it wasn't that these, these weren't necessarily the three largest of my, of my genera or anything like that. So it could just be that some of the groups are sensitive to the, to burn treatments or to the structural, um, co or structural component of these areas and some of them just aren't, so. That seems pretty consistent with the other fire and insect papers that are out yep. there. Some like it this way, some like it that way, and most mm -hmm. don't care. Yeah, which is why, you know, even though I think my study does kind of cover some of the some of the things other studies have glossed over, looking at a finer scale and things like that, really what I come away from it, mostly my literature review, what I come away with from that is just, you can't solve everything. But the more evidence you amass, the better judgment you can make, so. Uh, ground beetles, um, did you find the species that you, that you did find in your samples, are mm -hmm. they like generalists as far as habitat sensitivity, or are they, well, are they rare species, or, you know? Well, since I didn't go to the species level, it would be hard to say, because um, even, at, even at general, you're still looking at a fairly broad scale. Um, it's one of the most speciose groups of one of the most speciose groups on Earth, and so uh, it was kind of funny. When I got my identification book, it, it quite honestly said, you know, even when you're an expert, sometimes identifying these two species is difficult. So it could be that I do have specialist species, and I am going to look at Kirk Larson's paper because he classifies all of them. Mm -hmm. And some of the groups, I know I have a single species. So those I could look into, but some that I've got multiple species, or I suspect I have multiple species, I couldn't necessarily really tell you that, so. Uh, you were mentioning about the differences in burns. Mm -hmm. Did you explain how you burnt your plots? Um, mine, we did kind of a ring effect. So we'd start a back burn on one side. Um, we just kind of black out all the lines and then let a head fire go. So we did burn them all fairly consistently. <laughs> and especially in 2011, all of my burns were very complete burns. Um, relatively quick and since my traps were inset from the edge where we did start some of the backfires or um, some of the ones that might have heated the soil a little more the insects would have been a little farther from that so that and it was early enough in the season that they're probably starting maybe more from the middle of the plot um, I don't know where they'd be laying their eggs. Again, if they lay theirs nearer to stems and stuff like that, the molanes probably wouldn't be where they were choosing to lay them. But without knowing all of the life history, I can't answer that. Hmm. Yeah. I have one more grasshopper question. Okay. Nothing to do with your thesis. Okay. And beyond the light of fall, you see grasshoppers that look so lifelike on the stem or mm -hmm. Dead. dead and sometimes hollow. Is that just old age? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> That's one thing I haven't looked into yet, but I've had that same thought. Because um, some of the grasshoppers <laughs> I pulled out of my sample, actually, they had portions of their body that like the they, they looked like they'd been eaten away or collapsed in, and it looked overall like the grasshopper was hollow. That was kind of my thought that just like escaped out. And so again, 
I could be the horsehair worm. It could be something else. So I don't really know. Well, I will be around a little bit longer if you have any more questions. Otherwise, I want to thank you very much for coming. And um, if anyone's interested in a, in a center tour, I'll be standing over by the door if you want to take a look around. But thank you very much, Anna. Thank you.